In making this video, I had to overcome three major challenges, and for all intents and purposes, this is most likely not a subject that I should have touched. The first issue was the problem of time scale. From what point should I begin telling this story? A story beginning in China has so many twists and turns, and possible events that one could point to as a logical starting position, so as not to give you the lead up to this event beginning with the very start of the Shah dynasty, I will choose the date of 1862. Second is the issue of language. The Chinese tongue is a tonal language, hence I will use anglicized pronunciation. Third. The political aspect of what you're about to watch is a hotly contested field. There are still many people within living memory of many of the following events. Thus, in some cases, the blood of these conflicts is still wet, and hatred between brothers still exists from actions a hundred years in the making. But despite all this, I think that this is a very important story worth telling. So, take a seat, and enjoy the quick rundown on the birth of modern China. The year is 1862, and in the warm coasts of North Carolina, brother faces brother in the most deadly event in American history to date. The United States Civil War was a shock to the world, as the tensions of federal and state power creates a vast casualty rate thus unseen in the Western world. In this war, the newest and most boldest advances in mechanics and weapon technologies on display, from Henry repeating rifles, hulking metal ironclad ships, and hot air balloons acting as artillery scouts. But, on the other side of the world, the changing times have not even made a dent. Technology in the East was more or less frozen in the 1600s. Rather than soldiers being armed with muskets and rifles, the spear, the sword, and the bow found their place. The Chinese find themselves embroiled in ethnic, political, and religious conflict for the last 200 years, as the ruling dynasty of China was an ascended group of nomads who came to power in the 1640s, during the decline of the previous Ming dynasty. These new rulers of China were Manchu, and under the command of Asin Goro Norshai, pushed the Ming dynasty to the south of Beijing, and then established themselves as the new dynasty, the Xing dynasty. The primary problem of the Xing dynasty was the ethnic problems inherent in putting foreigners as the ruling class above the vastly more numerous underclasses. The Han ethnicity, which is what most people picture Chinese people as being, was forced to submit to the rule of these perceived northern barbarians, or Bei Di. The Xing government was strict, with discriminatory policies on the Han Chinese such as forcing the Q hairstyle, and segregated neighborhoods with the Manchu elite at the top. This new China was isolated from the world, and failed to modernize. By the 1800s, the cracks were finally showing in this Chinese vase. In 1862, things were going completely for the worst. The Xing dynasty was stretched thin by constant uprisings, and, and open revolts put the country in ruins both economically and physically. Two major revolts were occurring at this time period, and almost 40 million civilians would end up dying in ethnic cleansings by the Xing government. The Dungan Revolt and the Taiping Rebellion the bloody Taiping Rebellion was coming to a close, a rebellion spurred by Christian rebels in the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. In 1843, Han Zhuquan failed his entrance exams to become a governor of Guangzhou City for the fourth time. After that, he began having visions and fevers in which the Christian god told him that he must build a new kingdom on earth, and that he was the younger Asian brother of Jesus Christ. He played on the hatred of the Manchus by the Han, and convinced hundreds of thousands of people of his divinity. The Xing response was harsh, with 20 million people displaced or wounded many of which being the Hakka people, who were in the most support of the Taiping Kingdom. In the northwest mountains of Xinjiang and Nengxia, another looming disaster grew. In 1862, a fistfight over the price of bamboo sticks between a Muslim Hui Chinese man and a Manchu led to a brawl, which led to a riot, which led to an uprising, which led to an armed rebellion to establish an autonomous Muslim state in the west of China. This event was the Dungan Revolt, and for this, almost 15 million people lost their lives in the most brutal ways possible. Almost 80% of Gansu province was killed, and many of the Hui Muslim people fled to Russia or Central Asia to avoid further persecution. With the two largest wars you never heard of happening, and complete ethnic rebellion, the Xing Dynasty was in freefall. Understanding why these events accrued so many casualties, one must keep in mind the simultaneous efficiency and inefficiency in the Chinese system. 
the inefficiency in the armies of both sides of these conflicts having incredibly corrupt and apathetic leadership, which would culminate in the lack of proper supplies and oversight in these armies. An efficiency in the ease of brutality that one can commit against one's own people. For millennia, rape, loot, and pillage were some of the unwritten benefits of war. And for this reason, in most of human history, soldiers were considered only slightly higher in the social scale above prostitutes. To be a soldier was not a particularly respected career path by any means, and in many cases Chinese dynasties would give little to no oversight in their armies because of the combined racial arrogance that no barbarian would ever even dare attack us, we are under heaven's protection, and the fact that every single time too much money goes into building and maintaining the army, some uppity general attempts to rebel and overthrow the government. Thus, in waging war in this fashion, in order for a soldier to get more supplies such as food and clean water, he's often obligated to forcibly obtain such things from local peasants at spear point. Many times these peasants would try to stop this looting, but this normally would just end with the entire village being burnt to the ground and everyone's slaughter or taken as slaves. How ironic that you're killed by the people who vowed to protect you and your country. Of the ten most destructive events in human history, seven of them happened in China. And it is often said that Chinese history is more or less just keeping track of when one genocide ends and another one begins. Another important note to take in this type of warfare is that it's normally waged in China, and how it differs from here in the West. In Europe and America, whenever a large-scale war takes place, civilians are typically not needed to take up arms en masse, as there is already a large, robust, and well-equipped standing army because of the cultural trust in soldiers and their expectations. Eastern armies are far less armies in the traditional sense, and more or less are just gigantic mobs of bloodthirsty young men under the command of egotistical generals, with a possibly obtainable dream of overthrowing the current dynasty or replacing with their own. In Chinese civilization, the idea of the Mandate of Heaven, or the Tianming, is used to justify historical events. For example, the emperor is emperor because that's what heaven dictates, and anyone who overthrows said emperor was destined to because he was chosen by heaven to do so. In this case, civilians are very easily persuaded of royal legitimacy because all an aspiring conqueror has to say is, Heaven has chosen me, my victories so far prove it. But of course, this passive population phenomena could also be explained by the number of spears being pointed at said civilians to comply with such statements. Either by the word or by sword, the mandate of heaven was upheld. China, much like Japan, was trapped in a limbo between reform and tradition. In one corner you had the foreign money interests of trade and cheap labor inherently beneficial to foreign powers, and in the other you have the internal push to become more western and elevate one's position in the world. The Japanese had relative ease in this regard, as liberal reforms were pushed through their government and western systems in regard to education and military practice were easily put in place. One could attribute Japan's ease of modernization with their relatively high literacy rates and distant isolation from western powers. Another could attribute China's failure in this regard to their incredibly nepotistic and corrupt governments alongside poor literacy rates. Japan had advisors and diplomatic contact with France, Britain, and the United States, and as such were able to adopt Western methods from across the world, but namely they adopted the French methods of representational government, military organization, and educational traditions in order to build relations. Of course, reactionary movements in Japan grew, and in 1868, the Boshin War began. The Japanese liberal imperial faction decisively defeated the poorly equipped conservative shogun forces and restored all power back into the emperor's hands, which put an end to the traditional shogun rule and unified the country in the Meiji Restoration. China, on the other hand, was under constant supervision by foreign powers as well, but rather than adapt and grow technologically, the Chinese reverted to Confucian doctrines and expelled the Western barbarians, or Xirong. Chinese superstitions of the West came from France and Britain's constant attempts to open Chinese markets to the world. The Western powers supported illegal opium smuggling operations in tea and jade, and on multiple occasions China was forced to give coastal cities to European nations. Hong Kong and Shanghai to Britain, Macau to Portugal, Zhenjiang to France, Qingdao to Germany and Austria, and Port Arthur to Russia. And in addition, to give France legitimate rule over Vietnam in 1885, for the duration of the 1880s and 1890s, China would continuously give concessions and port cities to foreigners. But despite all this, China was still slowly accepting Western ways. Of course, China's greatest enemy would be revealed not to be the Europeans, but the Japanese, or the Dongyi, Eastern Barbarians. 
By 1895, tensions had arisen between China and the Japanese after Japan attempted to assert its influence over Korea, which had for time immemorial had historically been a Chinese ally. By this point, China's land army had still remained relatively primitive, with the spear and sword still taking center stage alongside a few outdated western rifles. But the Chinese fleet had more or less modernized by the 1890s, as the Xing Dynasty purchased about 25 to 30 outdated vessels from foreign powers. But, while the ships were new, the tactics were old. Chinese admirals sailed headfirst into Japanese battleships, and their entire fleet was annihilated. Japanese forces of the First Sino-Japanese War were miles ahead of the Chinese, and were able to secure victory with ease. The Japanese acquired many Chinese ships as prizes, monetary reparations, influence over Korea, and the provinces of Liaodong and Taiwan. Hatred of these foreign devils had reached its overflow, and in 1898, armed militias operating with the support of the Xing government began openly killing and beating foreigners on sight. Many of the foreign port cities began building garrisons and defenses, so these militias marched towards the undefended foreign quarter in Peking. These militias were known in English as boxers due to their recruitment acts involving elaborate martial arts, mock suicide with blank bullets, and convincing many people that they were protected by heaven and that the barbarian bullets can't hurt them. The organization called themselves the Brotherhood of Righteousness and Harmonious Fists, rallied under the ancient Confucian proverb, Sung Wang Ryang Yi, revere the emperor, exterminate the foreigners. In 1900, a coalition of all nations with economic interests in China formed, with almost every major power attending. Russia, Japan, Australia, France, the United States, Britain, Italy, Germany, the Netherlands, Spain, and Austria all joined forces to crush the boxer threat, and to protect their territories in the small protected castle complex in Peking. For two months, under heavy boxer attacks and dwindling supplies, the coalition held their grounds amidst the onslaught of delusional fanatics. The Xing government, by the end of the Boxer Rebellion in 1901, was more or less completely powerless to rule their own country, and as Chinese tradition has it, provincial warlords began asserting their influence. A concept foreign in Europe and America is the idea that a privately funded army acting without the supervision of centralized states can openly declare themselves the rightful rulers of a province or a land mass. In China, many prominent generals and government officials saw the rapid decline of the Xing dynasty, and each was assured that they would get a piece of the pie in the imminent collapse. Of the Xing nobility no longer loyal to the regime, their private wealth bankrolled the purchase of large amounts of foreign weapons and advisors, which in turn led to these private governments being able to have more power in some territories than the official Xing government themselves. The Middle Kingdom was doused in gasoline, and all it took was one man to set the entire country alight in 40 years of civil war. That man was Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen was born to a middle-class landowner family in a rural village in the south of China. His family could afford to allow him to get an education from abroad, and for the rest of his life he traveled between Hawaii, Japan, and California, and returned to China multiple times as one of the few foreign-educated physicians in the entire country. The match that would set alight Asia with the fires of war was struck in 1896, when his barbaric Western medical practices were denounced as criminal by the Xing medical authorities. Sun Yat-sen fled to the British protected city of Hong Kong, and with his colleagues he began formulating a plan to overthrow the dynasty. For 15 years he attempted to fund uprisings and labor strikes in numerous provinces, but all of these were quickly extinguished by the primitive yet still numerous Xing army. But by 1910, the dynasty was quickly becoming completely bankrupt, and allowed Britain and France to build private railways in order to repay the debt. This was an outrage to the Chinese people, as this more or less completely transferred authority in the Chinese economy to foreign powers. By October 1910, things were completely out of hand, and laborers rioted all across China. When the dynasty's armies fired on civilians, this wave of civil unrest suddenly became an open civil war across the empire. Sun Yat-sen formed a new Chinese state under the advisorship of British, French, and Portuguese officials who funded his unification movement with modern weapons and money. The new state, known as the Tengmenghui, and they proclaimed themselves as the true legitimate government of China. Over the course of four years, China went from a 3,000-year-old monarchical system to a modern liberal republic in a lightning-fast revolution, 
which had the world stunned at the true ineffectiveness of what China once was. In 1911 and 1912, China would be at peace, as the new democratic methods were attempted, but there was one major flaw in the provisional government's power. The only areas in the effective authority of the revolutionary government was the southern portion of China, of Guangdong and Guangzhou, and the remainder of China was under the power of numerous warring factions with their own agendas. The event known as the Xinhai Revolution was, was a success because of the many promises and agreements made between the revolutionaries in the south and the various warlords in the north and west. With their forces combined, they ousted the dogmatic Xing dynasty. After Sun Yat-sen's death in 1912, the fragile alliance between warlords and revolutionaries was broken, and in 1913, the Xing general Yuan Shikai proclaimed the Beiyang government and formed a new dynasty which aimed to reinstitute the Xing royal family. Yuan Shikai's dynasty lasted only two months, but this gave other warlords the incentive to go on the offensive. From 1913 to 1930, most of China would be under the power of petty and tyrannical warlords, all of which demanding hegemony in their respective territories. Anarchy and war was a fact of life. Many of these warlords embodied stereotypes, and others were driven mad with power. In the Northwest, numerous Muslim confederations did battle with the Tibetans and the, and the Muslim Uyghurs. And in the South, mountain campaigns in Yunnan and Sichuan devastated entire provinces. In the Northeast, the numerous reformed Manchu peoples did battle with the Wan Shikai's Beiyang government. And on numerous occasions, coups were attempted to put the Xing dynasty back in power. Chaos, confusion and bloodshed was the norm rather than the exception, and the worst of the worst had come to pass, politicized war. For the most part, there was no real distinction between the motives of the various warlord cliques, other than each of them demanded as much authority and land as possible. In 1924, after the dust had settled from the Russian Revolution, the Soviets began funneling massive weapon shipments to China alongside thousands of copies of communist literature in Chinese. The revolutionaries in the South cemented their power in the region, and declared themselves the Kuomintang, the unification movement which swore to defeat the warlords and usher in a new era of peace. In 1926, with the backing of numerous foreign entities, the Kuomintang, under the command of Chiang Kai-shek, declared a state of war between themselves and any warlords not willing to surrender their power to the revolution. The event known as the Northern Expedition began with the massive movements of troops north, and their organized leadership was able to smash the poorly equipped and corrupt warlord armies of the Zhili, Anhui, and Sichuan cliques. Moving further north, the war with the pretender dynasty Beiyang clique ended the same. As the Kuomintang pushed straight into the outskirts of Beijing with a third of a million men, the leadership in the Beiyang clique either committed suicide or fled north into the crippled Fengtian clique. Over the course of two years, the Kuomintang had managed to capture a majority of the parts of China that mattered. After the northern expedition, things somewhat normalized, and with the Kuomintang content with just letting friendly or neutral warlords do their things in the west. This expectation was shattered after the Japanese, going directly against the orders of the League of Nations, attacked the vulnerable Fengtian clique in a surprise attack, citing a damaged railway as a justification for the war. The Fengtian clique couldn't even last a year, and this new puppet state that Japan formed was known as Manchukuo. And as the head of state, they put the final emperor of China, the young Prince Puyi, who in 1911, at the age of six years old, had his throne taken away from him by the revolutionaries. Immediately after the Japanese successfully defeated the weakened northern warlords, worst for worst came in China. The Kuomintang movement had support by numerous countries, including the Soviet Union since the beginning, and the ideological subversion in the nationalist movement led to a schism in the heads of its leaders. In a shocking move, General Chiang Kai-shek declared all communist sympathizers enemies of the state, and ordered the immediate execution of all workers suspected of holding leftist ideology. In April 12, 1927, 15,000 people were killed or missing for the affiliation with communist organizations, and in a haste, any communists aware of the massacre began to escape to the royal hills of Sui Wan province. The first half of the Chinese Civil War had begun, and with it the first steps had been taken towards the complete collapse of the old order. In every revolution, there is a man who steps forward to lead the new society, in this case a young farmer who got into politics. Mao Zedong is either like the devil or like the second coming of Christ, depending on who you ask. But his past was as shrouded as mystery as his rule, but one thing was for certain, his message read 
resonated. In Chinese society, the lower classes of merchants, peasants, and craftsmen were literally seen as a different species by the nobility, and as such allowed them to easily abuse and kill large amounts of commoners with, because of this distinction. The class divides such as this existed in China up until the modern era as well, and could still be argued that they still exist today. For a man to try to give voice to the beleaguered and strained peasants was reassuring, and as such populist movements such as communism and syndicalism could easily gain traction. After the Shanghai Massacre, all leftists and revolutionaries escaped to the northern city of Yan'an, which was fortified with hundreds of bunkers and cave networks. For almost 15 years, the communists held their ground in this little crevice in the mountains, while the poorly led West Kuomintang army failed in time and time again to apprehend the revolutionaries. Hundreds of illegal printing presses were operated alongside homemade gun workshops, and using the tunnels, the communists were able to transport vast amounts of shoddily produced firearms and reasons to use them. Soon, pockets of communist guerrillas would appear in urban and agricultural centers, and like a cancer, they travel around the country leaving tumors of rebellion. On top of this, things had only gotten worse. In 1937, the Japanese made their move, after claiming that a Chinese sniper killed a Manchukuo border guard. The Japanese crossed the river, and with days they were shelling Beijing. The weary and preoccupied Chinese army was pushed back rather easily by the armored Japanese advance. The war was such a massive affair that Kuomintang press gangs would force families at gunpoint to have their son be drafted to fight in the war. Many times not even given a proper gun or uniform, and just told to either follow the army or starve to death and escape. Bullets were worth more than bodies, and China had plenty of bodies to spend. Numbers vary wildly, but anywhere between 15 million to 60 million people will lose their lives as a result of this war, which will be known as the Second Sino-Japanese War. But it overlaps with World War II, in which the two coincide with each other. The Chinese gave their heart and soul to stop the advance, but eventually, in December 1937, the Japanese reached the capital of China. Nanking. Full savagery was on display by the Japanese. Mass executions for the fun of it, beheading competitions, mass rape of Chinese women, and the forcible evacuation of almost the entire city's population to the west. With the capital turned into a sadistic plaything, the Kuomintang moved everything possible to the west in the rocky hills of Chengdu Valley. Every single piece of industrial hardware and machinery was carried any way possible across rivers, forests, and mountains to pre-built underground complexes in Chengdu, where the nationalist forces regained their strength for the coming storm. The Japanese plan was not to occupy the entire country, but only to secure crucial economic and trade centers along the coast to ensure that the Japanese had their influence over China's economy, being that almost all of the Japanese forces were located only along major cities and railways. And although China and Japan called a ceasefire, the guerrilla war continued for years inside Japan's occupied zones. Peasants, spurred by either patriotic fervor or communistic hatred, cut supply lines to the Japanese city garrisons. Warfare, which will be seen in the Vietnam war becomes a reality. Villages are burnt, people are shot without trial, looting on a mass scale not even seen by Mongolian standards, and the sowing of the seeds of revolution further into the hearts of people. It is said that an armed people are a polite people, but this is far from the case in China, where peaceful political debates between nationalism and communism once occurred, there is now a state civil war between a multitude of warring factions. A full-blown war with smaller civil wars mixed into the chaos, but despite all of this, Mao's communist city of Yan'an was never conquered, and the Japanese never attempted to subdue do the revolution. Time passes, Japan suffers defeat after defeat at the hands of the combined allied forces. But slowly and surely, the Chinese across the hills gathered their strength. The day came. In late April 1944, the Japanese broke the official ceasefire and attempted to capture the entire coastline of China rather than just the northern half which they had controlled before. By this point, the power dynamic had completely shifted. The Chinese had possession of at least American and British equipment, including aircraft and tanks, while the Japanese were in complete disarray as their entire fleet had been more or less destroyed and the supply shipments had stopped. Although victorious in their operation to capture the coastline, this was Japan's last hurrah for the war. The Chinese eventually pushed the Japanese back into Manchuria, the north from whence they came. In 1945, the Soviet Union intervenes and destroys the entire combined forces of the Japanese and Manchurian armies in what amounts to a red blitzkrieg. And like that, the eight-year-long struggle had ended, but this reveals the last true test of strength, the Second Chinese Civil War. At last, in 1946, after many wars of conquest and hegemony are over, the final decision for China's future had to be answered. Red or blue? Nationalist or communist? 
and with that, the Second Chinese Civil War comes into being. The first primary concern that this war will incur is the sheer amount of foreign weapons at play. The Communists have been receiving constant weapon shipments from the Soviet Union for the last 20 years, and the Nationalists have been buying weapons from every single country imaginable, from Germany, Spain, Britain, and the United States. Both armies were equipped with a semi-random mix of uniforms and weaponry ranging from the top-of-the-line machine guns to the traditional Dadao sword, which was more or less a gigantic meat cleaver. Many people at this time in high positions of power were thinking about what a possible land war between the Soviets and Americans and what it would look like, and one only has to see the chaos of the Second Chinese Civil War to see what a glimpse into hell looks like. The second issue is the issue of positioning. The Chinese armies were all more or less unified under one command structure, with the warlords integrated into the mix or declaring themselves neutral in this affair. But the situation on the ground was atrocious. The chances of survival in many of these conflicts was slim to none. And still worse, many of the officers and generals put in these positions were not there because of their merit and genius and leadership but because of how much political leverage they can play, and how their loyalty affects the leadership of the country. It is better to have a loyal idiot than an intelligent antagonist, and for this reason the nationalist leadership would, like so many times before, fail in every regard to quickly and efficiently accomplish their objectives. The armies of both sides were positioned in a chaotic spattering of communists in one sector, nationalists surrounding them, again surrounded by communists. The war was less of one solid front moving back and forth traditionally seen in warfare, but rather a million different small encirclement campaigns trying to surround each other, which at times would result in a massive 100,000 men casualties as an entire army corps surrenders due to lack of supplies. The third and final factor of this final war in the Chinese mainland was the matter of depletion. During the last 20 years, starting all the way with the Northern Expedition in the 20s, the Kuomintang had completely depleted their entire manpower, and this was unaided by the fact that any and all people still loyal to the Kuomintang cause were still located located in the western mountains of Chengdu, far away from the active front lines in the, in the coasts and in the north. There had not been a point in Chinese history at this time where at least 3,000 people didn't die a day from combat deaths, and at times casualties numbering up to 1 million deaths per month was just an accepted part of warfare. The entire eastern and northern portions of China had been completely reduced to ruins. Roads were just a few chunks of concrete at this point, and every single farm or factory had either been used for slave labor or is now a smoldering heap. You were deemed blessed if you were just starving and homeless. But this, of course, is if you still even believe in heaven at all at this point, after seeing your entire family having been murdered or your village being burnt down like so many million other people have had done to them. The Kuomintang will eventually lose the Second Chinese Civil War. There is no way they could have won. But not after taking every single possible person still loyal to the regime with them in their evacuation to Taiwan. America still guarantees the independence of the Nationalist Party in Taiwan to this day, and Taiwan still claims that they're the rightful owner of China, and that they're just experiencing a temporary rebellion that only got out of hand for now. And one day the Taiwanese dream of returning to China as the rightful rulers of the Kuomintang. this entire short movie, you may have noticed the recurring theme of me saying casualties ranging into the tens of millions on multiple occasions. In order to put this into perspective, let me give you a quote from the now long-dead dictator of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin. A single death is a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. During this entire ordeal, from 1862 to 1950, they've estimated that somewhere between 100 million and 1500 million people have died by the turmoil. Soldier or civilian, as if there's a difference at this point. To put that into perspective, the current population of the United States is 300 million. Now imagine half of the entire population of the United States dead in the worst possible ways imaginable. Burnt houses, mass beheadings, entire generations of young men forced into the meat grinder of war, and to be left with a totalitarian communist regime that will continue to cause massive unintentional famines and accidental genocides against its own people, while simultaneously slowly erasing everything that even hints that there was a country before the regime ever came to power. Of course, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking that, oh, there are like a billion Chinese people anyway, it's just a drop in the bucket, right? We learn history so we can improve ourselves in the present by looking back at what people people in the past have done wrong. Do we allow ourselves to fall into political divisions which grow like a cancer at the hands of those desperate for power? Divisions in people, be them racial, political, or religious, can all be exploited by the powers that be to keep the little people squabbling over unwinnable realities. If there is anything you should take away from this entire endeavor, you should remember the one ancient Confucian proverb, do unto others as you would have them do unto you.